an original MCM production. Now, to introduce our program, Dr. Steve Hargarten with the Center for International Health at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Steve? Thanks, Dan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The Center for International Health and the Milwaukee Rotary Club are honored to welcome Lieutenant General Patricia Haroro to Milwaukee as the third speaker in our ongoing Global Health Partnership Lectureship Series. The Center for International Health is lead agency of a consortium that includes the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, the Medical College of Wisconsin, Aurora Healthcare, Marquette University, Freighter Hospital, Children's Hospital Health System, Concordia University, the City of Milwaukee Health Department, Milwaukee County Government, and the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. The center develops and connects the global health programs and activities of these organizations and improves global health through partnerships that benefit people and communities locally and globally, generating meaningful learning opportunities that produce the next generation of global health leaders. Today's visit by Lieutenant General Hororo has been made possible thanks to the combined efforts of three of the consortium members, most notably Freighter Hospital and Kathy Buck's leadership, the Medical College of Wisconsin and President Raymond, and of course the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. This has led to a fantastic opportunity for faculty, staff, students, and members of the consortium members to hear from a leader uh, in global health in the military. There's been a great deal of excitement surrounding the Lieutenant General's visit. In December, she completed her four-year tour of duty as the first female and nurse to command of the U.S. Army's Medical Command and serve as a Surgeon General of a military department throughout the 239-year history of the Department of Defense. She has been the recipient of numerous awards and recognitions and was honored by Time Life Publications for her actions at the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001. She has also been awarded with the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star Medal, and France's National Order of Legion of Honor, and many other honors. In 2015, the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing honored her with the Cameos of Caring Award, and she received the President's Lifetime Achievement Award. In addition, and this is where I became a little bit more comfortable in introducing a general, I've never really done this before, <laughs> that Family Circle magazine named her one of the nation's most influential moms. I thought that was just great. So it is our honor and privilege to have Lieutenant General Hororo here today and to, we look forward to hearing your presentation on the role of the military in global health. Please welcome the Lieutenant General. It's such an honor to be able to be here and to spend a little bit of time, but I first want to just say thank you. Thank you for what you do each and every day to support our warfighters and their families. Thank you for supporting the armed forces, and thank you for your willingness over the last 30 years to make a difference in the lives of those around the globe, because you all have been doing that for so many years. So it's a true honor to be able to be here. I'd like to first start with a short video that allows you to see Army medicine. So just when I talk about capabilities, it'll help put it in perspective of the capabilities that we have in Army medicine, and then we combine those with the Navy and the Air Force. Who is Army medicine? We are over 151,000 active duty, civilian, and contract personnel serving across five continents. 
in 11 time zones, providing healthcare and readiness across the globe. We are medical, dental, research, education and training, public health, and so much more. We are responsible for the care of nearly 4 million beneficiaries. We provide over 11 million outpatient visits per year. We conduct $1.4 billion in research and development. We further health and science diplomacy around the world. In recognition of our success, our research arm, the Army Medical Research and Material Command, was named one of the top 100 global innovators by the multinational media and information firm, Thomson Reuters. This is along with other notable recipients, such as 3M, Apple, DuPont, and Microsoft. We are 148 professional health education programs, including top-ranked nursing anesthetists and physical therapy graduate programs. When viewed through a civilian lens, our patient satisfaction rates are over 90%, far exceeding the national average of 70%. And this is at a time when we still support thousands of service members that are deployed in combat environments. We are multiple treatment facilities on the list of healthcare's most wired hospitals for several years now. We provide telehealth in over 18 time zones and 30 countries. We are partnering with other military services federal agencies, and leading organizations to solve complex national health issues like concussive care, obesity, and preventable diseases. Throughout our history, we have taken what we've learned, understanding diseases like yellow fever, transfusing blood, evacuating casualties, advancing prosthesis and transplant surgery, to improve care to our service members and advance healthcare throughout society as a whole. Today we are engaged in every aspect of the business and delivery of healthcare. But ultimately, it all comes back to our four priorities. Delivering world-class combat casualty care. Building the readiness and health of our force. Ensuring a ready and deployable medical force. And providing for the health of our families and retirees. That's why we exist. We are not just a healthcare system. We are a system for health, where our medical treatment facilities serve as health and readiness platforms that provide us a worldwide presence. We are Army Medicine, serving to heal, honored to serve. So I thought that would just kind of help to get a little visual. So when we talk Army Medicine, you have a, a little perspective about that. You know, I think when we talk about global health, we're really looking at how do we have better health around the world and how do we make sure that as we have collective entities in this room today we have government we've got academia we've got industry we've got our veterans that are in the room and we've got students all of those coming together working with our military in a collaborative way i think improves better health we have the opportunity to change lives we have the opportunity to change a community a nation and a world and that really is the perspective when we talk about our military in the role of global health, because it's not a mission for us, it's actually a tool. And it's a way that we can collaborate with interagencies and external agencies to really improve the health around the globe. Let's we'll see how this works. Okay, how did you do this? <laughs> I feel like an AT&T commercial. Is it better yet? Okay, Rita. So I've got to do it over my shoulder? I've just got to do the right one. There we go. <laughs> Every day it's a learning and a humble experience. So when we look at global health, there's a humanitarian mission that comprises it, a political mission, a military mission, and then diplomacy. And it's these four primary programs and reasons that have to be linked together that really allows our combatant commanders to have the right capabilities for their completion of the mission and national strategic strategy. So when I talk about combatant commanders, those are war 
warriors that are from each one of the services that actually oversees a geographical area and underneath that geographical area they have all the resources of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine and every capability across DOD. Part of the capabilities that they use in a scalable, tailorable way are military medical capabilities which allows us to really help them get into countries that they would never would be able to get into and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Because in 2012, there was almost a fundamental shift that you saw across the Department of Defense to really focus on stability operations. In a world that has been so globally unsettling, where governments can be toppled just by social media, we really needed to look at a different way to be able to have stability and really support those new nations with their democracy. And so it's coming together with like-minded organizations that really challenge our military and we're able to actually partners in ways that we may not be able to do that on alone, alone. Because a lot of times our missions are military to military. Very seldom do we have military civilian, but we're usually always in a supporting role and very seldom are we supported. So we're there to enhance capabilities of civilian organizations that are out in these countries to be able to either improve their health, their water, the engineering um, that needs to be there, the roadways, and, and really look at how do we help to decrease the spread of diseases in a very complex world. There's not a place in the world right now where a plane doesn't land in a different size, but we are so globally connected and there's echelons of connectivity that has occurred. And there's a positive side to this and a downside. The downside is that what we've seen with Ebola, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but diseases spread so easily just because of how many people travel each and every day. But when you look at this, I think the upside of it is that you can look at that and say, how do we form global communities that link innovation, inspiration and ignite new ideas to solve some very challenging problems that are out there. And I think that's the focus that you all have really focused on in the military is looking at connecting that collaboration to really improve overall global health. And the reason why we really want to focus on this is that for those countries that have a fragile grip on democracy, that's where they become very vulnerable. When there's diseases that proliferate their country, or the economy is very, very poor, and Bangladesh is a great area where you've just recognized that when people live on $1,000 a day, I mean a year. You've got Cambodia, where $1.47 is the average that a lot of them make. Very, very substandard living. That breeds the ground for terrorist organizations to come in and to be there. And then you have the challenges that we have internationally and globally. So we're vulnerable to that occurring and this is why we really want to focus on how do we spread goodwill and how do we improve their overall health and their standard and we do this from a very regional and kind of international perspective and lens because as you're looking through on the political side this is actually a picture of Liberia there's political reasons why we want to be in Liberia there's military reasons why we want to be there there's definitely diplomat and diplomatic reasons why we want to be there and humanitarian and a lot of it centered around the involvement in Liberia with the Ebola response and the crises. And this is a country where there's been so much political unrest, but it's a country that connected back to the U.S. just by the spread of the Ebola virus. And I'll mention a little bit more of the U.S. role with that. But for political reasons, we wanted to make sure that we didn't have government collapse there. Then when you're looking at Somalia, the same thing in Somalia, same thing in Bosnia. All of us are connected. There's occurrences that are occurring in the Middle East where there's so much unrest. And these are the grounds where terrorist organizations can have their breeding grounds that are in there. All of these organizations and all of these countries have local organizations or external that come in to help with global health. And the military needs to be there to be as supportive as possible in those areas when it meets those for one of those four criteria to be able to support when we have organizations coming in to try to do goodwill. And so when we look at the military medicine's global health engagement efforts, what I'd like to really focus on are some of the different areas that we've 
actually been able to have an impact around the globe. And the first question you've got to ask is, why are we in this business if it's not a mission in the first place? And, and really, it's to improve the health and safety of our warfighters. Because if we're going into countries that have diseases, that has poor water systems, that has a lot of crime, then we increase the risk for our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen and marine, and their family members. It allows us to expand medical readiness because we don't go to war alone. If you look at the last several wars that we've been in, they're all with coalition forces and with partners. And so the more that we can build up their capacity and their capabilities so that we have a better health system in those countries, the better we are in trying to achieve the goal of international democracy. And then when you're looking at um, our national security objectives, part of global health is such a key tool that is being used more and more and really has seen since 2012 the impact of being able to use this. And, and these are the reasons why. It really is a diplomatic bridge. You know, we just had an exercise two years, it's, it's going on almost two years now, military exercise out in the Pacific where we actually had China and Japan and some other countries all together doing a military exercise. That would never happen if it was a military to military exercise. But because we had the focus on health and health care, we were able to break down those barriers and have those two countries in the same area, all working together to share medical expertise. When you look at where we are around the globe, this is a very, very small snapshot. What I wanted to do is just to highlight a couple areas for you. So if you're starting at the top, you'll look where in, with NATO, we are in, um, intimately engaged with NATO. We just finished a health service um, support assessment that really looked at Afghanistan, and we looked at women's health issue, we looked at technology across the battlefield, we looked at battlefield care from the point of injury all the way back, and we made some recommendations. Well, those recommendations actually got adopted by NATO, and that is now the standard. So more and more we're looking to have a common standard in military health care around the globe, which then feeds back into their internal countries to be able to improve their level of care that they deliver. We're in Pakistan with working with Afghanistan and Pakistan together, and it's AFPAC hands, and it's a way to put our military on the ground working with civilian and the military together so that we understand their culture, we start forming relationships, we share medical expertise, and what it allows us to do is to build those relationships and through those relationships to really forge other opportunities that hopefully will allow us to have a better partnership and better relationships for the future. In Georgia, we're also in Georgia with looking at threat rejection. The other thing that we're doing in the country of Georgia is that we have shared our amputee care with them, that they had a lot of their soldiers that were um, injured and so we shared our rehab and rehabilitative medicine so that they could bring up their level of care. And so I could go around but I'm, I'm conscious of keeping on the time limit because I heard this is a group that stays right on time for their luncheons and so I won't go through each and every one of these. But I just want to highlight some of those. There is a global presence. Just Army Medicine alone, we are on five continents um, with a, a large array of skill sets that are there. When you're looking at um, the challenges that we have with infectious disease, we've just got to remember that in World War I, we had more soldiers that actually died from infectious disease and from mosquito-borne illnesses than we had from any bullet that was fired. And so we're now seeing the Zika virus, the Ebola virus, the bird flu, and those types of threats. And then if you go back to that slide where it had globalization, how quickly they can travel, Part of what the military is, um, military medicine's involved with is global surveillance, and we're mounting a very robust and collaborative effort in that area. And if you think about having global surveillance, think of where we would be if we had that when the HIV virus broke out. But we didn't have that then. We're much able now as a nation to respond a lot quicker. We also um, are working with developing vaccines for this because we're now seeing that the drugs that we have to treat 
and the countries that are using those drugs, now they're starting to have a new strain of mosquitoes that are resistant to it. And so we're in research and collaborating in those countries with it, because we actually have labs in Thailand and Cambodia working with the Navy. We have labs in Kenya that we um, marry up with their researchers to look at how do we solve some of their most complex problems. And then with the Ebola, I'll spend just a little bit of time on this. The Ebola response is one, we have been doing research with Ebola since 1976. And so when this Ebola crisis broke out, um, a very, very different response for our nation. One, because it hit home and it became um, very intimate very, very quickly. And I'll share with you because it's something that the military has never been asked to, but it, I think it redefines when we talk about global health is that the President of the United States actually turned to the U.S. military medicine and asked us to be ready to respond should the outbreak in Dallas become more uncontrolled. And so the reason why I share that with you is that that is one very different than a mission we've ever had. There are laws that contain what the military can do within our nation. And so the agreement and the discussion that we had at the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and then the Surgeon General level and the other um, service chiefs is that we can't go into for-profit hospitals and provide care. But what we could do is come together in Army, Navy, and Air Force and develop expert teams that would be ready to respond should the nation need us and to do training and to be able to help with the expertise. And so that was a solution that was there. We also stood up hospitals across the nation that became CDC approved and accredited to respond should this become an outbreak that we needed to respond across our nation or if any of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines actually contacted this virus and needed to come back. So we quickly responded, and I share that with you because I think what that really discusses and kind of portrays is that global health is coming closer and closer to home. And that when we think of the lens when we talk about global health, we tend to have a very outward perspective. I think our perspective needs to be a lens that looks from all different angles. And we look at global health from inside the United States, we look at global health outside and in with the international community using the best minds that we have together with that. We've also been engaged with responding to um, radiation was one of the biggest issues that occurred in Japan because of their nuclear um, plants that actually lost their capability and um, so we went in with the team and helped with that expertise and then we've developed a database that are monitoring their patients and their local local nationals. And then with women's health, this is one of the biggest growing needs that I think is out there with global health, is women's health and with their children. Because if we can develop and bring up the level and the status of women around the world and their children, I think then we can have societies that can have high employment, that can be able to decrease the crime that's in the area. We have an integrity of both gender, ethnicity, and education. And I think this is the area that we have really started to focus on more and more when we're going out to different countries, is going in and not just providing care, but really teaching them so that they then can be able to do self-care, family care, and then care across their nation. And it's really looking at health literacy. And then just looking at, um, we've moved away from med reds, which were going in, providing care, and then leaving. And what we found was then we had a vacuum and a void. And so we're trying to do more of going in, providing expertise and care, but then doing it at a standard that they can continue to provide that level of care so that we don't insert too high of a level and then we, we actually do more harm than we do good. And then with the Zika virus, we're working with intra-agencies, external agencies, the CDC, um, all to look at synchronizing educational monitoring response, because this is gonna be, I think, very similar to the Ebola virus. It's gonna take all of the experts, both nationally and internationally, to be able to respond to this and make sure we put the most protective measures in place. And then with this, it's just a laundry list, and I won't go all, over all of them, but what I'd like to point out there is it ranges from rehabilitative measures, psychological health, sharing what we're doing in traumatic brain injury, but really focusing on health. 
and sharing what we're doing in the areas of performance triad of sleep, activity, nutrition, and how do we change the focus of improving the health and the health readiness of the nation, both internally and externally, and then a large focus when we're talking about tropical diseases and working in that area. And so, give just a second to look at this. Probably the one thing that I'd like to share with this is, although it's not a mission for us, it's a very important tool. And it's a tool that allows us to have a huge influence, both from a social, economic, a political, and a humanitarian, and a goodwill. And with that, what it's allowed us to do is have second and third order um, positive impacts that have come from that. So as we've done Goodwill missions, what has occurred just in the area of warrior care, the UK and the US came together and pulled in 20 other countries together, and we actually shared all the advances that we've seen in warrior care and technology to improve the health, both mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional, of how we care for our veterans and our warriors. That has now turned into 20 nations participating in warrior games, so it's moving the concept from disability to ability. And when you take the time to see a triple amputee swimming and being very competitive, what it's shown is it's giving them the courage to go out and to excel in life and to do things differently. And so we've come together with those countries to make sure that we are trying to bring everybody up to the highest level and standard of care and then be ready for whatever conflict would, would happen next. And then I want to leave you with, with this photo. And that photo is one where it's the human touch. We can go in with the best medical advice. We can go in with the best medical care. But we should never forget with technology that there's a human element in everything that we do. And so as we rely more and more on technology and we're in a high-tech environment, I'd ask you to kind of think as you're doing global health and your goodwill missions and humanitarian missions, that you think about the right touch and how we leave people feeling in different countries is really the measure of success. There are adults now who were children during World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and they have goodwill in their hearts towards Americans because of the way that they were treated as a child by an American service member. And so when you're in those countries and you're making a difference an individual at a time, it's not just what you're doing at that moment in time, you're making a difference in generations to come. And I think that's the collective power when we talk about global health and what we're trying to do internationally and around the world. And so I'd just like to thank you all very much for one, what you do each and every day for taking your expertise, your compassion, and your heart to make a difference in the lives of those that are living around the globe and for the support and the partnership that you have give, given the United States military. So thank you very much, and God bless each and every one of you. production.